Good morning, dear friends, dear colleagues, and dear attendees, or good afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from, and uh, greetings from Accra, Ghana. Aquaba, as we say here in uh, Akan local language, which means welcome. Welcome to this uh, master class in theory of change. My name is Matteo Guidotti, and I'm the director of the program Strategic Project Management for Development. I have the pleasure to deliver today this master class on theory of change. That is a topic that uh, will be addressed in the first module of this program. I remind you that uh, the first module will take place uh, on the 21st, 22nd of October, the second, 28th, 29th of October, while the last uh, and third module on the 4th and 5th of November. Classes will be delivered Friday afternoon and uh, Saturday from 9 o'clock until 5 p.m. The training will be delivered face-to-face -face in our beautiful campus of uh, La Maison de la Paix in Geneva. Uh, you can find all the information about this program on the website, as well as the registration form. I hope this class will trigger your interest in attending this program. Also know that a second dedicated information session on the training on this program will be organized uh, on the 6th of October, two days before the beginning of the module. So we really hope that you will be able to attend. A few words about myself before we start the presentation. I have 25 years of experience in project management and evaluation in international development and cooperation, not for profit, but also in the private sector. My professional activity is basically split into two parts. At the Graduate Institute, I work as a trainer, lecturer, and a research associate with the Center for Conflict Development in Peace Building. But I also am the managing director of a Swiss consultancy company called Magister, where I do consultancy mainly in the area of institutional and organizational reforms, capacity building, resource-based management, and education, mainly in Europe, Africa, and uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, I'm delivering this class, this master class from a hotel room in downtown Accra. So I hope the internet will not fail us. It should not be the case, but in case we have some issues or the internet uh, um, will, uh, will, uh, will be, will be any problem, my most sincere apologies and thank you in advance for your kind patience. And it should not be last long if we are facing any any um, I would also like to thank my dear colleagues and friends that have been involved in the preparation of this webinar, in particular Stephen Tag, Diomed Carlucci, Maureen Junot, and Jimmy Johnson, who is the senior program officer, with whom you will have the chance to talk. Please do contact us by email or by phone, or if you have any questions regarding the application form. Okay. My appreciation also goes to Maria Eleste Riudu, who is the technical assistant for this webinar. A couple of logistical points before we start. The class will last more or less 45 minutes. And uh, I will take your questions at the end of the presentation. Please use the Q&A box to raise your questions. And also note that at the end of uh, the webinar, you will receive uh, this presentation by email. Okay, next page, please. So, what is uh, the content? What are we going to cover today? So, the main focus of this web of this uh, webinar is uh, to understand what is the theory of change. Why do we need a theory of change? How we should design a theory of change, and finally, who is concerned by a theory of change? Uh, we will focus in on the common mistake when it comes to design a TOC, and I would like to share my experience as an evaluator. And I also, as a, as a person, I've been in, I had the pleasure to be involved in the facilitation of this kind of workshop. And finally, I would like to share with you some good practices and how to avoid these problem mistakes and people that are basically wasting your time, wasting resources, and delaying the entire process. I will also share with you some key references and some website and I hope for those of you that are interested can also consult in order to build up your expertise and further your learning in the 
this presentation will not cover again will not cover the mechanics how to design a CO2 okay it's your your thing how to design a problem tree and solution tree I will not cover what is a, how to do a stakeholder analysis in a complex analysis I assume that these different tools and methodologies are known and that I could not press enough this what we need in order to design a CO2. Okay. And you will see how these different tools actually integrate in the process to design uh these for CO2 of three central CO2. Next slide, please. So some background about the TOC. Uh, first of all, uh, this is something that is recent. It's been um, it is a technique that basically has been developed uh, in the field of evaluation. However, it's becoming more and more mainstream in uh, in the development uh, community, but it's still a kind of a bad word. We don't have a unique definition. We still don't have a unique fair practices and approach. My intent today is to show you or to share with you what I consider at the same time good best or good practices, but also something that you can easily translate and to you. Um, also, very important to keep in mind is that TOC is part of what we call this logic planning model. Again, problem tree, solution tree, logical framework are models that we use in order to design the result chain of uh, an intervention that can be a project, a program, or a policy. Uh, the TOC is an analytical tool. We will talk about this, but it's also a process. We will discuss about how to design in terms of how to organize the workshop. And finally, it's a document. Okay, that is the final, basically, the final outcome of it. Next slide, please. So why the TOC? The TOC is basically a powerful analytical tool that will assist you when it comes to answer in a structured, rigorous, organized way to the following key questions. So what is the problem that affects a specific category of beneficiary? How do we want to solve that problem? How do we want to tackle that problem as a development agency concerned to address specific need or specific problem of a category of beneficiary. Are there any alternative ways to address that problem? Who needs to be involved in order to make sure that that problem is solved? What are the challenges? What are the risks? What are the hypotheses behind in order to have this problem solved? And uh, finally, when do we expect that change to happen? So this tool will be able basically to structure in an in a organized way the answer to all these critical, critical questions. Next slide. So when it can be used at your thing? I just give you an example now when we use a TOC for the planning, for the design phase of a project, okay? And here is precisely the idea and how we have to design a project aiming to change uh, or addressing uh, a problem or to basically tackling a specific need of a specific community. The TOC can also ensure those to be used during the implementation phase. And here the idea is to stop and uh, basically looking at the results on the ground and comparing whether the results match what was planned at the beginning. Okay, this thing happening as expected. Okay, so are our hypothesis is to are the actors that we have identified that uh, still the key players have their position change. And uh, the QC is also useful at the end of the project cycle management, that is the evaluation phase, when uh, we assess, we evaluate how change has happened. 
and we want to understand whether change has happened as was planned. So again, the QC is not something that is used only at the planning stage mm -hmm. before we implement the project for the design, but also during and after implementation. Next slide, please. So what is the theory of change? What are the basic ingredients? Now, we could come up with something more or less simple or more or less complex. I think that if you speak to those key elements, you are on the safe side, okay? But let's make sure that you are on the same page and that we understand what are these different topics. So we will talk about the chain of results or result causal link. We will talk about stakeholders, assumptions, indicator, and timeline. What do we mean by the chain of results? The chain of results is nothing else. The idea of if we do this activity, then we will achieve this result. If we achieve this result, then most likely we will be able to deliver another result. And if we manage to deliver this second level result, we should be able again to deliver the next the next result. So it's a causal link or causal pathway that basically identifies in a linear and in a coherent way what are the different levels. Let me just give you an example. Let's imagine that uh, we have a project that uh, aims at uh, reducing infant mortality rates in ethnic minority communities in, let's say, north of Vietnam. So what is the result chain of this project? Okay, so we build health clinics in the different communities. We hire trained medical staff. We buy equipment. We pay adequate salary. And most of what is the result that we're going to see? Well, we will improve access to medical services of the community. We manage to improve access to medical services of the community. Most likely, we will be able to reduce infant mortality. Okay? So if, then, if, then, if, then. Let me give you another example. Let's imagine that we want to cut by half teenage pregnancy in, uh, let's say, North Brazil. Okay? So, trained sexual cancer, and they go in the school and they teach safe sexual practices to the students, to the teenagers. If we pay them adequate salary, if we pay them for transport and food, most likely we will obtain as a result the fact that teenagers will raise their awareness on safe sexual practices. And if teenagers improve or raise their awareness, then, as a result, well, most likely we should be able to reduce teenager pregnancy in a specific community, in a specific location, that is in case it's not a Brazil. Let me give you another example. If, uh, and uh, I think this one is very interesting because uh, we can have uh, the same objective but with a different results change. Let's imagine that uh, we have another organization that is working also and aims at reducing teenager pregnancy in the north of Brazil. Okay, but their chain of results is slightly different. And what are they starting for? They're saying, well, we know that teenagers are very sensitive to role models. Okay, so let's engage with social media influencers. Okay, so if we engage with social media influencers that we know that they have a, 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 a high impact on teenagers. And uh, if we provide technical support to design a social media campaign to this media influencer, then we will be able to reach out to students and raise their awareness on safe sexual practice. 
if we manage to reach out and raise the awareness on sex, safe sexual practice of this nature, most likely then we will have a positive effect in terms of reducing teenage pregnancy. Okay? So this is the chain of results. Um, Dying a chain of results, developing a chain of results is a difficult exercise, but it's a crucial exercise that you will have to do in order to take, you know, to design or to craft the type of change that you want to, to bring about with your product. Now, dying a Sorry, I am sorry to interrupt. There is a problem with your voice. Uh, it's not very audible by the attendees. So if you do, you have maybe a pair of headphones or something. You know? Maybe that would help. Uh, hear my voice. It's the quality is not good. Uh, they say I have received some messages on the chat about okay. this. Ah, unfortunately, I don't have any headphones with me. Uh, let me just see one second if I have anything else. Just give me one second, please, and I will check you. So, yes, um, I hope you managed so far to, to follow me, and uh, I apologize, I regret for these little annoyances with the sound. Uh, I would like now to share with you, and please let's move to the next slide, a, a, how we go about it, how we design a TOC, okay? And uh, I will take as an example um, a training on, let's say, result-based management, okay? So development practitioners attend a training. What is the result chain? What are the results that we expect it to happen? So let's start with the, uh, the first point. Obviously, well, trainees attend the training in result management. If trainees attend their training, well, trainees then will design better projects. Those projects will be more relevant and more sustainable, okay? If uh, trainees manage to design better projects, then the beneficiaries, the community, will receive better services, better good, more relevant, so that they better address their specific needs. And if this happens, okay, so that beneficiaries will get better services, then the overall community will be better off. So now we have unpacked the result chain that we expect to unfold when it comes to design a training, okay? So this is step number one. Now, what do we need to do? If uh, we now focus on one specific uh, link, okay? Then, and please, we go to the next page. Let's assume that we now focus on the link between trainees attend the training in result-based management and trainees design better project. So, next point, please. What are the risk and hypothesis? We have to make a distinction between risk and hypothesis here, okay? So, the risk is something that is under the control of your, you as a project manager, of the project management unit, as we call it, okay? So you have leverage on that. You can manage a risk, and in fact, you will have a risk management plan. An hypothesis is something that is outside your control, and there is nothing you can do about it. So you will, def you will depend on the success of your project will basically depend on the fulfillment of that specific hypothesis. For instance, the, if you have a change of government and the new government is not anymore committed in any poverty reduction policies, well, you as a development agent engaged in the specific country aiming at reducing poverty, well, you will most likely have to face a well, not conducive environment. So that will put at risk the effectiveness and the existence of your project. OK, 
Okay, so what are the risks and the hypotheses? So that are the assumptions of uh, your, to in order to move, to be able to move from the level of trainees attended training and to change to happen. The trainees design better project, more relevant and sustainable. Well, first of all, trainees should not leave the organization after the training. This is a risk or this is a hypothesis. Most likely is a risk, is something that is under your control. In fact, as you know, one common practice is to ask the trainees to commit themselves to stay in the organization, let's say for one year after the training, okay? But uh, what else do we need? What are the risks that might be involved from moving from this level of result to the next level of result. Well, line manager must provide opportunities to adopt and mainstream this new result-based management methodology. Now, if I'm now equipped with these new techniques, with this new expertise, but my environment within a work does not allow me to use these new techniques, well, basically, you will not be able to translate that the fact that I have been attending a project and now that I can design better project. Okay, is this under your control uh, as a as a development agency that is delivering this training? Mm, most likely not. Most likely not because unless everybody within organization attend your training, which is never the case. Well, what happens is that you will have trainees that they go back to the organization, but they are basically the only one that have been equipped with these new skills, expertise, but um, their colleagues and uh, their peers don't necessarily understand what are these uh, techniques and they don't necessarily adopt them. So it will be very hard for you to convince and to basically have on board your team. But finally also the organization within this trainee's work must also be willing to invest, be open, and uh, to promote result-based management culture. So you see that uh, those are the hypotheses and the risks for you to move from the trainees attend a program to the next result that is training design by the project. Okay, now what is next? The next is, as we mentioned, we mentioned earlier, are the stakeholders. So what do we mean by stakeholders? As you know, stakeholders are actors that have a stake in the change that uh, your project aims to bring about, okay? That uh, stake or that interest can be in favor or can be against the change, okay? If it's in favor, then you will somehow define a strategy to team up with those stakeholders to push you in favor that they, of the change that you want to to trigger. If they are against, most likely they will resist to change and therefore the question is, is how and what kind of incentives you have to provide them in order for them not to put at, at, at risk the success of your project. Who are the trainees, excuse me, who are the stakeholders that are involved, that are part of this um, of this level of change. Trainees, obviously, as a target group, but also, as we mentioned, the line managers and the colleagues, that they have to be able to accommodate, to accept these new techniques, this new methodology, result based management methodology, but also, as we mentioned, the organization overall, the overall organization that are very favorable to support new way of working with new processes and so on and so forth. Now, the next point in a tier of change is that for each level of results, we have also to appreciate the timeline. So when this change will happen, ladies and gentlemen, this is no wishful thinking. We have to be as rigorous as possible. It's not when we would like this change to happen, but when this change will happen, okay? so. Let me stress again the fact that in order to be able to appreciate these different elements, you will need to have a deep and comprehensive understanding of the context within which you work. That's why it's critical to have a context analysis and also, obviously, of the context of, excuse me, of the stakeholders that are involved in this process. 
reason why you need to have a, a strong um, uh, stakeholder analysis being performed in parallel or before the TOC. So we assume that this change will occur six months after the training. Finally, the last point of the theory of change are the indicators. The indicators are, as you know, qualitative or quantitative marks that allows us to appreciate, to measure, to assess to which extent we have managed to achieve that specific result. That is, trainees now design better projects. Okay, so the indicator that we will use we will basically test the acquisition of knowledge with pre-test, post-test, before attending the training, six months after attending the training. Okay, and the indicator here is, let's say, 80% of the trainees pass the test. Okay, now we basically have all the elements of the theory of change for one specific level of results. In order to have a complete theory of change, we will need to have this information, risk and hypothesis, stakeholders, timeline and indicators for all the level of results that you have identified. Okay. Now, next slide, please. What is the, a good way to proceed? What is my, my, my recommendation in this regard? Well, the best way would start will be by, uh, will, excuse me, will be by starting to drafting or preparing, designing your problem tree and your solution tree. Why? Because it's precisely when you design your problem tree that you start to think and unpack the causal links. If we achieve the result, then we hope most likely to achieve the other result. And if we achieve this other result, and so on and so forth. So again, you remember that a few minutes ago during the introduction, I stressed the fact that these are planning tools. So the problem tree is a critical tool that you need to put in place in order to design a TOC. And uh, my recommendation would be to move from the problem tree to a solution tree and start to design the theory of change that is to plug in the four element that is risk and assumption that is uh, stakeholders timeline and indicators for each one of the causal link causal level of results starting from the solution tree Okay, and finally, because this is very important, ladies and gentlemen, that we are doing this exercise because as an output, expected output of this TOC process is to have a logical framework. Okay, so this will be somehow the, the, the steps that you will have to go through in terms of preparing your TOC. Next slide, please. So, who is concerned by TOC and how I would recommend to facilitate a TOC process. So uh, the TOC process must be facilitated by the project management unit. Okay, so you as a project manager, you have the responsibility to basically to drive this process. Okay, however, this is not something that you're going to do alone. Not at all. On the contrary, you must involve the stakeholders. Okay. Now, which stakeholders, how, that's a different question. But what is critical for you is that you must involve the stakeholders for the simple reasons that you want to have their buy in. You want to have a shared understanding of what is the theory of change, what is the change expecting to happen. And finally, also critical, keep in mind that you are. Your contribution, your valuable contribution depends on your point of view of your understanding of the problem at stake. Different actors will have a different understanding of the need of the community or of the problem that must be tackled. Again, if you are part of uh, the beneficiaries or the community, well, you will have an understanding that is very different of the problem if you are seated, let's say, in the in the donor's country uh, and you are 
uh, desk officer in charge to basically well, to design the project. And this will also be very different than the standing from your colleagues at the field level. So these are critical stakeholders that you should engage with and you must have on board for the, for the, for the process. Uh, I also think that it's very important to have local authorities and central level authorities. Okay. Now, having said that, what is the process? How should you organize? So, I would suggest to have at minimum two workshop. Okay. However, this workshop must be preceded by a sound preparatory work. So, what you have to do in order to prepare these workshops? First of all, you have to identify the participants that will attend the workshop. Okay. My advice would be have people that are technical people, okay, that they understand the language, they have a minimum of expertise in management, okay, they have a minimum of expertise in planning, they understand what is a result chain. Um, so designing and identifying the right attendees to these shops will highly determine the quality of the work done and the success of this workshop so this is something that you really have to put some some some, some thought about it most likely these people will have to be trained so prepare some training basic material and provide example Okay, the TOC is not something that is very straightforward. Okay, we are talking about uh, uh, management tools with causal links, so it can be something that is complex. So make sure that the trainees, excuse me, that attend of the workshops when you will prepare the TOC, have a, they speak the same language, have the same concept. Okay, and provide examples so they understand what they will be doing during, during those TOC workshops. And finally, also what is critical, agree on the objective of the workshop. So why you are doing a TOC workshop, okay? Is because you want to have the buy-in of different stakeholders. Is because you want to make sure that you share the same understanding of the change. Or is because you need to design a project. So this element must be clarified before the beginning of the project, simply because you don't want to create the uh, expectations that will not be met and you want to make sure that people that will attend the workshop agree on the objectives and they are able to there be there as active and actively contribute um, with relevant input to do this uh, process again my recommendation would to have minimum two workshop the first workshop it would be uh, you will have never underestimate the need to just make sure that people will understand what you're going to do. So have a quick wrap up sessions, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, remind, a reminder of the key elements of the TOC. Okay. And uh, during those first workshop, uh, I would be, I would suggest, I would recommend you to be ambitious, but not too ambitious. So you will start by the problem tree and you will identify the assumptions, okay? So if you manage to have a problem tree and slash solution tree and the assumptions, make a distinction with the hypothesis and risk, I think that um, you have fully achieved the objective of the first workshop. The second workshop, well, you validate uh, the result chain that you have designed during workshop one and you tackle the issues on the indicators and of the timeline so when you expect that change to happen the last uh, element the last uh, building blocks the last step of the of the process will be to make sure that the theory of change the document has been agreed and has been fully endorsed by the key stakeholders. Next slide, please. So what are the common mistakes? Here I would like to share a little bit what is what I have come across as an evaluator 
and uh, what I have observed as a facilitator of this kind of workshop. So um, I often hear people say, we cannot do a TOC exercise because we don't have the expertise in house. No, no, I don't think so. I think that someone should uh, somehow train himself or herself to be the facilitator, but um, we also need to somehow um, um, understand that this is a critical exercise that to do it that will lead to the logical framework so if you have the capacity to do a logical framework you are able also to do a toc okay so do not be discouraged and we need to demystify this idea that we need to have high level of expertise to design a toc the second mistakes is that uh, well, TOC are designed without the active involvement of, of key stakeholders, okay, or is too participatory. So in both cases, you, are, you will have to find the right, uh, I would say, um, the right uh, um, balance between having a participatory input so that you can incorporate the different understanding point of view on the problem and on the changes that you want to trigger by the different stakeholders, but you don't want to have something that is too participatory, but it's, it will be too difficult, too messy, and too inefficient to manage. I have also observed that, uh, well, these uh, TOC often are very theoretical, okay, very complex. In French, we say usine à gaz, or are documents that are not friendly user at all okay too many pages a thick complex document that guess what nobody will read okay and it will most likely confuse people more than anything so keep it simple keep it friendly and ideally keep it on one page then you can have in the next the explanation of the different level of results but you should be able to present your toc in a straightforward in a relatively simple way. Uh, other common mistake is that uh, the TOC is a list of activities. So there is no chain of result. So the different activities are not coherently linked if, then, if, then, if, then. Okay, so basically the results or the outcomes are set as just like actions. So always, always think about, okay, what is the result? If you achieve the result, what is the next? Often people just rephrase the same level of result, but with different words. Ladies and gentlemen, it's really about changing, okay? And we'll come back in a moment about the change. What do we mean by change? What we need to observe? Uh, again, often what I have noticed that there is incoherence or the, there is no logical sequence of these results. So uh, the test that I invite you to do is always what we call the upward test. If then, if then, if then, and this has to flow, but it also has to flow downward. Okay, and this happened because, this happened because, this happened because, and if it flows upward and downward, then you have designed your result chain in a way that is coherent. Often, TOC uh, are, are, are missing the stakeholders, are, or you, uh, you come across TOC with other risks, hypotheses, they're missing the indicators, or are missing the timeline. So you have a TOC only when you have identified not only the result chain, if then, if then, but also the stakeholders that are involved, what are the assumptions, keep in mind that we're breaking down into risk under your control, hypothesis outside your control, indicators that we measure, that we assess the level of achievement results and the timeline, when we expect to have that change to happen. And finally, common mistakes that TOC does not lead to a logical framework. So it's basically disconnected for the programmatic documents of the project. You are doing all this exercise because at the end of the day, what you want to have, you want to have a sound, robust, and evidence-based 
logical framework. I repeat, evidence-based logical framework, okay? Or result-based logical framework. This is really, really very important. Next slide, please. So what are the good practices? Let's now just discuss about the good practices in the process. So my advice will be start by the solution tree, okay? Make sure that the solution tree is done in a rigorous way and the causal links, how the different level of result are, are, are linked is clear with up, down, downward test. Think in terms of results, think in terms of change. So when do you know if you have a change? What do you have to observe for change to happen to say, yes, this is a change or no, this is not a change. So you will look into the result will be in terms of adapting new behaviors, acquiring new expertise or new skills, having new practices new motivations, new attitudes, new opportunities, new resources. So this is a kind of result, the kind of change that you want to identify, that you want to uh, um, qualify in your result chain, okay? Um, also, I would uh, advise to not only list the stakeholders that are involved, but also try to appreciate what is the power or force and what is their interest, okay? So to really push your stakeholder analysis to a point to understand, okay, for instance, the line managers are very powerful, okay? Are they interested, and what is their interest with regard to having, well, um, staff that have acquired result-based management, new result-based management techniques, okay? Are they interested in that or not interested in that? So this is the kind of analysis that you should always also do, not just listing, listening to the stakeholders, but appreciate their interest and their power. Again, make sure that you distinguish when it comes to identify the hypothesis between excuse me, when it comes to identify the assumptions, what are the hypotheses? The hypotheses are not under your control. And guess what? You might remember that the last column in the logical framework, you have the hypothesis, right? So what must be fulfilled in order to move from one level of result to another level? In, if you use the language of the logical framework, we use, we will say what we need to move from the output to the outcomes to the outcomes to the impact, okay? And secondly, the risk. The risk is something that you manage as a project manager. You will have a risk management plan and you will have actions that are linked to the, the, the management of the risk and if that risk occurs. Timeline, when it comes to timeline, ladies and gentlemen, it's not wishful thinking, but uh, not about when you wish that happen, that change happens, but when you think that change could happen, is expected to happen, okay? So often we, we, we observe in logical, excuse me, in a TOC, that the, the timeline are when we expect, when we would like that change to happen. No, it's when that change is probably going to happen, okay? And finally, as I was mentioned earlier, the document, the TOC, should be self-explanatory. Ideally, one page, okay? So if you need to spend too much time to explain the content of a TOC, it means that your document is not really friend user, and most likely your document will not be used, will not be read. I'm, I'm sorry for that, excuse me. <laughs> Just give me one second. Excuse me. That's what happened where you are delivering a webinar in a, in a hotel room. So I was saying that this makes sure that this is a self this, uh, explanatory document. Okay. I have uh, seen a uh, tier of change that have five, six pages. Uh, by the time you have gone through these pages, you are confused, you are lost. So again, my strong advice, as a standard, one page, you should be able to basically capture the 
TLC of your project in that kind of format. Now, good practice with regard to approach. Plan hide, it takes time, okay? We talked about two, eventually three workshops, okay? So it's something that you cannot improvise. It's something that you have to plan within your activities, okay? Because this will take time. Will take time also the fact that you will need to have a facilitator or several facilitators, okay? And you will also have to make sure that people speak the same language. So you will have some component of training for the attendees of the workshop. Plan ahead, plan ahead, this is critical. Uh, be clear about the objectives. Why you are, again, convey people to attend the workshops. So make sure that everybody has the same understanding. So you not create uh, uh, expectations that you are not able to make and to deliver. Keeping in mind that the TOC is an ongoing process. We discuss about the fact that you use it at the planning stage to design a project, but also during the implementation and the evaluation. So on a regular basis, ideally every six months, that's a good uh, rule of thumb. You should be able to review the TOC. Re excuse me, look at your TOC, look at what's happening on the ground, how your, how your project is, is delivering, and see whether the hypotheses that you made are still hold true, whether the stakeholders that you identified are still the same, whether the positions vis a vis to the change that you want to bring about are still the same, and so on and so forth. So critically review the TOC, and this will help you to inform also your approach. Make it inclusive, okay? However, not for all. Be mindful that uh, the people that will attend your workshop uh, will determine the success of such workshop, okay? So make sure that people that, again, they speak a little bit the language, they are familiar with the management, they are familiar with planning projects, and um, and, uh, and this is something I think is very important to keep in mind. Again, we already discussed, discussed the fact that uh, you should uh, train a little bit uh, the participant on the TOC. And finally, finally, I could not stress this enough, have the courage, the good sense to critically review the TOC. Often what I hear is that, well, you know, the TOC was prepared by our senior managers, so uh, you know, we are kind of uncomfortable to basically challenging it or to review it or to discuss and so on and so forth. No, ladies and gentlemen, I think this is uh, at the end of the day, you are there because you have to deliver a change and you are accountable vis-a-vis -vis to the beneficiaries, accountable to the authorities of the country where you're living and you are implementing your project. So you are part of an organization, but your organization is there to deliver change, to tackle a problem of the beneficiaries of a community, okay? So the ability to critically review a TOC is, I think is very important and it's, I would say also a deontological, I would say obligation on your side as a serious development practitioner. And finally, that's my last stop, my last point about uh, the good practice, mm -hmm. make sure that this entire process lead to a completed sound logical framework, okay? We are done for this, uh, for the content of, uh, of this uh, webinar uh, on the TOC. Before I open the floor for the Q&A, I would like just to um, indicate a few references that I have used uh, for, for the preparation of this webinar that I used to train myself on TOC and that I think that are very relevant and very well done. Um, in particular, I have highlighted three of them, is uh, Mr. Russell Gasser, and then Main, John Main, um, that uh, are, have written these papers that are very comp are comprehensive, friendly user, and uh, they provide you, I would, I, would, I personally think excellent and relevant tools to design at TOC. 
Um, and uh, my last point also, there are plenty of references on the internet. Um, by the way, there are also plenty of courses, okay, Mock and Spock, check on Coursera, you will be able to find uh, several courses also on TOC. But also, I have, uh, I would like to share with you a few um, websites that uh, are very useful and that address either uh, the theory of change or the change what we need to do and what is change and how we have to facilitate change. Um, before we open the Q&A session, let me remind you that uh, uh, the strategic project management uh, uh, program will start, uh, and this is the next slide, module one, as I said, 21st and 22nd of October, the second, 28, 29, and uh, the fourth uh, and the fifth of November. During module one, we will basically cover in the design of uh, a project. Okay, so what kind of change you want to trigger? So we will cover a problem tree, we will cover the solution tree, stakeholder analysis, context analysis with the different tools, with the different methodolog methodology to use it, and uh, we will uh, end uh, module one with the logical framework. The second module is about uh, the design of the tools and that we need to design the operational and management tools that we need to put in place before we start to implement a project. I'm thinking about a monitoring plan, I'm thinking about risk management plan, I'm thinking about a calendar, I'm thinking about the schedule of the different activities, I'm thinking about the governance of the project, I'm thinking about a knowledge management system, communication, and so on and so forth. And we will also zoom in on the implementation. So how we are going to use those tools while you are implementing the project to basically steer and guide the implementation and, uh, um, and, uh, and uh, the implementation of the project. And finally, module three, we will focus mainly on the last point of the project cycle management, that is the e evaluation. Uh, each this program has been designed in a way that uh, each module can be taken separately, although I would uh, strongly suggest if you are interested to take the three modules because uh, you will be able to have an entire understanding of project cycle management uh, only by attending the three modules. However, you can take each one of these modules separately. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, again, I'm very sorry for the for the poor um, uh, for the poor sound of my voice at the beginning. I hope that uh, things have been improved with the with the um, with the the headphones. And now I'm happy I'm happy to answer to your questions if there are any. Okay, so we have a first question from Mr. Khalif. Thank you very much for your question, Mr. Khalif, and welcome. Do you recommend building and uh, refine the TOC with a team through a brainstorming session involving different perspectives? Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, this is something that is critical. So you might remember that the third point uh, is uh, uh, precisely what you are addressing and you're addressing a critical point and i thank you for that is that uh, you have a workshop workshop one where you design the problem uh, tree and you try to understand what are the assumptions and you have a second workshop where you will add uh, the again the stakeholders the timeline and the indicators but once you have finished this work keep in mind this you're going to do this work with a restricted number of attendees, okay? So it's important that the, all the stakeholders have the buy-in of what you have done. So yes, this process of validation should happen. It should be the last, basically, activity of the process. So make sure that uh, whatever TOC you are designing, okay, is something that reflects the interest 
and the expectations of all the different stakeholders of the change that you want to bring about. Um, the next question is from uh, Mr. Salim. Thank you for your question. I understand TOC is a logic model which gives us the overall picture of the project and then we create detailed logic models, results framework, log frame for the detail, including time frame indicators. Are we assuming the other logic models integrating TOC in this presentation? Yes, you might remember the, again that uh, the problem tree and the solution tree should be the starting point, the first document that you use for designing, for unpacking the result chain. And that's your starting point to design a TOC. And the end of this process, you should have a logical framework. Okay, so the usefulness, and this is very important to do this process because it's a lengthy process, it's a difficult process, and you will use lots of resources, is to have a sound logical framework. Okay, now you might have a very large and complex um, TLC, and yes, in that case, you might have a situation where you have several um, projects within that. So you will have for each project or each program a logical framework. So yes, it's possible that from a starting point for a TOC, you will have you will design different projects. My advice would be that try to design a TOC for each project. So it means that probably you have a, the scope of the TOC is still too large of the change that you want to trigger is just too large. So at the end of the day, keep in mind that you will have to do a logical framework and you will have to identify activities, okay? Input, activities, output. In order for you to be able to identify the activities, the timeline and so on and so forth, well, you need to have something that is manageable, that is operational, okay? So I would think that uh, I would suggest you to scope it in a way that is manageable and you can easily understand what are the activities that you have to put in place. Um, next question, and uh, I thank you, uh, Mrs. Ryman. Did I understand correctly that the result chain framework is part of TOC rather than develop up to the TOC? Determine the change required to address the root causes of the problem and achieve the high level change in contribution to the vision of the project. Uh, the result chain is the starting point of your TOC. The, is like the backbone of your TOC. The result chain is if, then, if, then. And for each one of these different level of results, you will have to identify again, what are the risks and hypotheses what are the stakeholders that are involved in this change? You will have to identify what are the timeline for this change to happen. And finally, how you're going to measure if that change is happening. That is the indicator, okay? So yes, the result chain is a starting point, the backbone of the TOC. And my recommendation again is start by the solution tree because the solution tree is precisely the result chain of your project or how you expect to the change will unfold by your project. Um, thank you for these very important questions. Then we have uh, another question from uh, um, Mr. Salam. Different terms are used by different organizations. Yeah, yes, you're right, which is confusing. I definitely agree with you. Are there standards term to use a TOC? Uh, that's a very good point. And as I mentioned, one of my first slide in introduction that uh, um, it's, you're right. It's confusing different organization, different uh, multilateral donors, uh, development agency use their own concept. At the end of the day, we are speaking the same, we are concerned about the same problem. We might use different concepts, 
but the mechanic behind, the logic behind, the rationale behind it, you see, is the same. Again, we need to unpack the result chain. We need to identify the assumptions, timeline, stakeholders involved in how we measure change, okay? Regardless whether we are talking about uh, a casual, casual path uh, or so on and so forth. So my advice would be the following thing is that uh, make sure that you speak the same language of your organization. That's why it's critical before you facilitate this kind of uh, workshop with your colleagues is that you agree on the concept and you agree on the terms that you're going to use. Okay, that's why I think that is important to provide and prepare a small tutorial, at least some basic uh, training and uh, to also provide example. So again, everybody speak the same language. Okay, otherwise you basically, basically get lost just to try to no, I meant this, no, I meant this. And you don't want to waste, uh, waste time in, 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 on, on this uh, kind of discussion. Um, okay, now next question as a very good question also within the TOC, do you include impact? Yes, of course, the impact are somehow the highest level of results that our project aims to contribute to. So yes, this is something that you will include. And in fact, well, in a log frame, the highest level of results are the impact. So yes, I could not be more, 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 um, more um, convincing, I hope, that uh, uh, we are concerned by the results, the chain of results, and therefore, yes, we have to push it as far as possible. Now, we agree that the impact are something that is out of the control of your project, okay? So you, your project will only contribute to that level of result, right? But still, this is part of the results because even if you're not accountable to the impact of your project, still you contribute to achieve that highest level of result. Excellent. Um, now, could we use could we use a TOC for policy? Yes, for sure. Again, the mechanic, the rationale is exactly the same if you're working at the project level, at the program level, or the policy level. In fact, we have a TOC for policy. Um, so yes, the tool must be tailored to your needs. So don't wear it as a tight jacket and feel frustrated because you cannot uh, tailor to what you need to do. These are, once you have understood how to use a tool, then you are also be able to shape it, to tailor, to customize to, to the specific objective that you have in mind. So yes, it's sufficient flexible, at least keep it flexible so that you can use it, use it again for a TOC at the policy level, program level, and uh, at the project level. However, however, keeping in mind that when it comes to design a log frame, just make sure that the log frame, the scope of the log frame is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, reflects, okay, the different activities and result of your project. So chances are that you will have one log frame for one project. In fact, I think it's a good practice, even if you have a, a program and we define a program as a, 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 an umbrella for several projects, still you will have a log frame at the project level, okay? Now, at the outcome for the outcoming indicators, since these different projects contribute to achieve that uh, level of change, chances are that you can work at the program level. However, however again, my strong recommendation is to prepare uh, the log frame at the project level because you will have to monitor the project and you will have to also use resources to execute specific activities. 
And therefore, you need to know how much resources you need and when do you need those resources to execute those tasks and activity in order to achieve the output, achieve the outcomes. Okay, that would be that would be uh, my my advice. Um, we still have uh, could be use yes, and we still have one final question. Uh, yes. Uh, from Alessan, nice, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, the, um, the three workshops will be delivered in, in English. However, I, some of the references will be also in French. So I'd be happy also to share with you during at the end of each module of the workshop the references French. I mean, most of the references still are in English, but uh, there are some very, very interesting um, tutorials and um, handbooks uh, on uh, French, especially coming out from CEDA, that is a Canadian agency for development, and also the French agency for development. So the, the session will be delivered again in English, but, uh, um, but again, uh, I will give you references also in French. Okay, I think that uh, uh, I know we still have one last question. I'm not a project manager, but I am in, in information system specialist. I see an opportunity to improve my work, for instance, better on data quality throughout this year model. Okay, so what are the, the requirements for you to uh, register in this training? Uh, I would say that ideally you should have between two and five years of experience in project management. So we have designed this training in a way that uh, we assume that some basic concepts are, are, are known and you are familiar with uh, some basic instrument for planning and implementing. Although we are gonna push it far in terms of uh, how we can use these tools. This is not uh, necessarily, or we will start by, I would say, in a gradual way by making sure that the uh, fundamentals are clear, um, but then we will pick up some speed and uh, you will be able at the end of the three modules to design, implement, monitor um, a project. That's for sure. At least you will have uh, acquire that level of knowledge, of awareness, of understanding that if you need extra information, you are in the position to say, okay, I need extra information at this point. So you are basically aware of what you need and through the different references that I will give it to you, you should also be able to find the questions. Having said that, I'm always at your disposal, so I will also be happy to, to assist you and to help you in this regard. Okay, so I think that we have addressed all the questions. Again, I remind you uh, the um, I remind you the date of uh, of uh, module one, twenty first to twenty second October, twenty eight, twenty nine. The second module, four and five, fourth and fifth of November, module three. Classes are Friday and Saturday, Friday afternoon, and Saturday the whole day. If you need any information, you will be able to find uh, the registration form on the website of the Graduate Institute. And my dear colleague, Jimmy Johnson, who is the senior program officer, will also be more than happy to answer to your questions if you have anything in relation to how to enroll or anything else. And uh, uh, if you have content-wise, uh, questions, uh, she will basically transfer those requests to me, so I will answer to you. I think that um, we are done, and uh, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Again, my apologies for uh, if my voice did not go, uh, uh, went through clearly at the beginning, and um, greetings from Accra. Stay well, and I hope to see you in Geneva for the program.